Hey everybody, I'm here with Alex Irvine, who is uh, one of our contributors for the Dystopia Triptych. My favorite part of the interview is just holding these things up and watching. Yeah, look at those. Because I, I think I got my copies before you guys have gotten yours. But I haven't man, seen them. They're, yeah. yeah, they're stunning. They're beautifully formatted on the inside too. They're really, really lovely on the eyes. And your story was uh, lovely on the mind, um, even though it's got a whole bunch of terrible topics crammed into <laughs> one story. Um, so I don't, I don't want to spoil the, the story for anyone, but I do want to touch on some of the ideas you bring up because sure. it gives me a little insight onto the, the things that you, when, when we give you an assignment, write me a dystopia, what you choose mm -hmm. to write about tells me a lot about like where all of you as writers, your minds go when you think about what's wrong with the world. And you wrote about um, issues of immigration, um, issues of uh, fire and uh, environmental uh, ruin, um, issues of communities turning on each other, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of topics. You could write a story about each one of these, and yet you, the way you seamlessly blend them, um, I remember when I, I read them before 2020 went you know, to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> yeah. And I was thinking like, it's amazing how all of these interweave and feel completely real and genuine. And then 2020 showed me like, this is how the world works. Like, you know, impeachment and environmental ruin and uh, yeah. pandemic, and we'll just do it all at one time. So tell me about your thought process when someone says, write me a story about what's wrong with the world and, and how you framed this story. Yeah, well, the, the, my first impulse, um, when I think of a uh, something, you know, dystopia, post-apocalypse, you know, one of those story frames that, that you get is to say, well, what, you know, what, what is the angle on that, that, uh, that I haven't read a bunch of already? Um, and one of the things that I think tends to happen with stories like that is they, they focus on like super competent, prominent people and how they handle things. Um, but most of the people in the world are not those kind of super competent, prominent people. And, and I'm interested in, in their experience. You know, what is, what is the slow crumbling into dystopia like if you are not in Washington, DC, you're not a policymaker, you're not in any kind of place where anybody you know has any kind of influence. And it's just all kind of happening around you and you understand it at second and third hand. Um, and, but you have to deal with it. You have to deal with decisions that, uh, that are being made far away and don't take you into account. And so that was my initial angle in. Yeah, I thought you captured it really well. Um, and, you know, one of the other authors interviewed uh, that contributed um, said, you know, I asked him about how do you maintain hope with all the things going on and as you're writing about dystopic topics. Um, and they said, you know, you just have to think that you're going to make a, a, a small difference uh, mm -hmm. in your immediate surroundings. Like you, you just have to think that you can push it forward a little bit. You're not going to solve everything. And your story is kind of a story about that, about one person mm -hmm. that they can help one other person who's in trouble. Um, and I found it more emotionally powerful than the stories that write about um, lots of people dying in big calamity kind of things when it's that intimate and that real and you get to care about that one life that's in jeopardy. It really k kicks me in the gut in a way that uh, that I love as a reader, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm yeah. a comfortable reading it, but I, I, those stories stick with me. Yeah. And, and me too. And, and uh, the stories that the, the stories that have been most powerful to me as a reader are the ones that center, you know, one, one single life and, and, and narrow everything down because in the end, for most of us, um, you know, my, my sphere of direct influence involves, you know, five people, my wife and four kids. And so the amount of change I can affect in the world directly, especially right now when nobody can go anywhere and do anything, um, is, you know, those five people. And, um, and, and so, and I, and I think that's, that's more generally true for, for most of us. There's a circle of people that is, that is close to us whose lives we can make better. And if we can do that, then we should. And if everybody tried to do that, then we wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't be having a lot of these problems that we're having. And now that, and it's, it's kind of Pollyanna-ish view of the world. And, and I know that, uh, that, you know, the, that, uh, that broader historical forces are at work and don't always make that possible. Um, but in stories, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love kind of big Independence Day stories where everything is blowing up and, and, uh, and the planet's in danger. It does, I, I, 
I get a, I get a big kick out of those stories. Um, but the stories that, that, that really, that really get to me. And so the stories that I want to tell are the ones where it's that, that connection between, between two people, um, that, you know, the, the, everything that matters in the world distills itself down to that one connection. Yeah. Yeah. I also got, there's vibes of the underground railroad and Anne Frank and this idea mm. of, um, jeopardizing yourself to help the other, which I think we could use a lot more of just expanding our circle of empathy, um, helping, yeah. help, helping the oppressed because it's easy. Um, <laughs> I hear some background. <laughs> yeah. It's a four year old running rampant over there. <laughs> That's uh, a part of being, um, uh, trapped at home without school. So you know, it's, yeah. uh, I should talk to you guys. Um, <laughs> feel free to bring the kids in on the conversation if you want. The thing was, speaking of kids, you're, okay. you're, you probably grew up on comics, right? To write yeah, comics like you did. Yeah, I, I read lots of comics. Hold on. Well, hey, hello. I want an apple for myself, not cut up. Ask Avi to get you one, okay? Run down there and tell Avi I told you to get him one. Or told him to get you one. All right. That's okay. We've had cats and dogs and everybody make a... Yeah, I got dogs and a bird and kids and all kinds of stuff. So tomorrow oh. there will be a hedgehog here. Seriously? My daughter just, yeah, my older daughter just got a hedgehog. That's cool. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how you care for a hedgehog, but I guess you just. I, I don't. I don't fed, either. Right? But I, I think she does. So that's that's the important thing. Um. So I was gonna bring up comics because um. Mm -hmm. Uh. I, have you read any of The Walking Dead? I uh, yes, I've read all of The Walking Dead, and I write a Walking Dead game. Oh, I didn't and, know that. Yeah. Okay. I should have mm -hmm. done better research. Um. Oh no. It's a, uh, so, uh, is that the one on the PlayStation where you make decisions and it's like story based? No, the that's the Telltale game. I, the, the game I read is a mobile game called Road to Survival. I've been working on it for oh, four okay. years. Four, it's almost four years now. Um, new script every month and, uh, and there's, uh, parallel stories. You know, some of it is kind of loot gathering and building your house and, and, uh, and then there's a, there's a kind of story mode too that develops game original characters in the Walking Dead universe. That's funny. I, I had no idea. But the reason I thought about it was that comic. One of the the themes throughout is that the thing that we end up fearing, having to fear, is like each other in the mm -hmm. whether it's alien invasion or zombies or a, a yeah. pandemic. It's the 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 collapse of the law and the checks and balances, and then how the the bad humans among us become really the bad guys. And it seems to be something. Mm -hmm that you've picked up on because it's in your story as well. Um, yeah, there's, um, and I think I can trace my, the, the first time I encountered that idea and was able to articulate it to myself was when I read Salem's Lot. And um, which when I was a little kid, probably younger than I should have been when reading Salem's Lot. But, uh, um, but the thing about Salem's Lot is that it's got vampires in it, but the vampires are, the vampires are a catalyst for what the people in this town were already doing to each other. And it's, it's for that reason, it's one of my favorite King books because it's, it's one of the ones where you really see that sure there are monsters in the world, but there's nothing really more monstrous than what people can do to each other. Yeah. And, um, and so then I started thinking, you know, that there are a lot, there are lots of genre tropes that, uh, that, can be used in that way, you know, that, uh, that become just a lens through which to use human behavior toward each other. Um, I and, think where that really gets me is, um, you know, zombies have an excuse for what mm -hmm. they do. They're zombies. Vampires yeah. have to feed. A virus does what it does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an asteroid uh, is unthinking. And the earth is in its way um, yeah. as it's on its merry path. Um, humans don't have that excuse. So what's, yeah. what's horrific is that they could choose mm -hmm. to find a better way to get along. And, you know, you wrote this and I uh, worked on it with you well before this pandemic happened. Yeah. And I saw uh, just in, in this area of New England where communities really turned on each other just based on perceived fear on outbreak numbers. So, mm -hmm. Um, and, and things have flip-flopped where no one wanted anyone from this New York City going into their suburbs. And now no one in New York City wants people coming from rural states. It's just mm -hmm. um, these things were, were all hypothetical and they kind of, we write about them. And I've written similar stories, we write about them uh, on intuition. Mm -hmm. But then we watch it play out. Like, what does that, what does that do for you? As I, 
I know it affects me as a writer. What does it do for you as a writer and as a, and as a human being, as a father? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's strange to watch it happen because, yeah, I wrote these stories before, the, before COVID-19, but, you know, things like COVID-19 have happened before. And, you know, I, I, I read a little bit of history here and there. And so there's, there are things that tend to happen you know, um, and what's a, who, who was it that said history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. It rhymes, yeah. And, uh, yeah, um, and, uh, and so, you know, once, when, when we saw the, the, the COVID pandemic happening, one of the interesting things was that, it, that, was that how many stories we started immediately to tell ourselves about it, right? Um, there were, there were the, the wingnuts who wanted to blame some conspiracy in China. And then, you know, then there were the people who said, oh, it's only going to be in the big cities, which at the time it was all in New York and Detroit and New Orleans. And so that was the story we were going to tell ourselves was that it was only going to be, you know, hitting these poor communities and in places like that. And then, and then it uh, transformed itself again. And we realized we didn't know the whole story. And every, at every phase there, um, people became defensive and, um, portioned themselves out in different ways and threw up different barriers among different groups of people and then tore those barriers down and built new ones, you know, when, when the disease changed. And so in the, in the stories that I, that I wrote for these books, um, that's, that's one of the things that, you know, that has happened before. And so I wanted to see, well, what does that look like specifically in, in, you know, in a place where there aren't that many people, you know, like, you know, coastal Maine, down East coastal Maine, I live in Southern Maine. But um, but when you get you know 100 miles up the coast, things are things are pretty different. Yeah, I've spent time there, just um, sailing along the coast, and it's one of the most mm -hmm. beautiful parts of the country. Oh, it's fantastic, yeah. And I think that's uh, that's something else that's striking with uh, really good dystopic work is when you make the uncomfortable story take place in a part of the world that you think of as idyllic, mm -hmm. and, and you show that hey, these the, these are are universal. Goodness and our universal badness is universal, and you're going to find it even in these places that you think of as, as just ideal. And I've seen some of that in this um, uh, this year, as people that you know you have a really high esteem for show a bit of a crack that you didn't think was there, and, and that hurts you more than the people you expect it from. Yeah, it's uh, it it is unfortunate to see, but you know, people are who they are, and they get more who they are when they're under stress. Yeah. Uh, no, nobody nobody puts up a polite face when uh, when they feel like things are coming apart around them. And what's what's keeping you? You're very prolific. You work in a lot of mediums. And you write a lot. You've had I don't know how many novels you've written over the years, but it's uh, it's like fifty. Uh, I think. Oh my Close god. To, yeah. So we, I feel like everyone I'm interviewing is prolific, but you take it like to another level. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna talk to to Sean and McGuire later, who's like yeah. he takes it to the next level as well. But yeah. um, how, how do you find your time, and how do you keep finding new things to write well, about? Um, a lot of the stuff that I have done in the last ten years, or well, the last fifteen now, I guess, uh, has been licensed stuff, and I'm doing, I'm doing much less of that now um, because I've sort of started to transfer my licensed energy into games um and so you know i do this walking dead game i'm working on three games for marvel right now um and so i'm not writing as many movie novelizations and things like that as i used to and and, and tie-in stuff um but no the uh the the productivity thing i mean there, there's there's two things that drive it one is it's fun um, because like when somebody calls you up and says you want to write a Transformers novel that, that uh, tells the original story of how Optimus Prime and Megatron met, I'm like, yeah, yeah I do want to do that. You know? and, uh, and so the, that's its own inertia and energy, you know, momentum is a better word. Um, and the other thing is I, I you have, have hedgehogs to feed. I got head. Yeah. That's the thing is I've been able to make a living at this for, for a while now. And, uh, and you know, um, so I keep doing it because this is how I pay my bills and put my kids through college. And so that's its own momentum, you know? Do you play a lot of games? Do, do, have you played Last of Us Part Two by any chance? I haven't. I don't play nearly as many games as I would like to because mostly because I spend all that time that I would be playing them, writing them instead. Yeah. Um, but uh, I have a stack of games that I want to play and Last of Us Two is definitely one of them. I, I don't get time to play many games anymore, but a friend of mine said just for, for, to appreciate the writing, you have to play this game. Mm -hmm. And um, man, I can't wait for you to dive into it. It's, <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh, brilliant, brilliant game. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't wait to do it either.
Um, well, congrats on the Marvel stuff. That'd be a dream for me. I um, I would love to get into writing for games. I've never asked my agent to try to make anything happen, but I don't know if anybody would have me. But that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. It's really fun, and it's a it exercises a whole different set of storytelling muscles. Um, and so that's kind of it's it, and that's that's one thing that I've always tried to do in my career, I guess if if you call it that, um, is. You know, I, I like to write fiction. I like to write comics. I like to write games. I've done some animation. I've done some nonfiction. And every new thing that comes along, I think, oh, how do you do that? And uh, and it's fresh and it's interesting. And and um, so you know, I've been spending most of my time the last year or so uh, doing games. And so then um, the chances I get to write fiction, like for this project, I was like, oh, I get to write short stories again. This is beautiful. And uh, and so everything. When you're when you're constantly switching among modes like that, everything is fresh and everything is in, is a change of pace. Oh, and that's why I like doing it. There's a lot to learn from that. I, that's a good writing advice for people, I think, in general uh, and life advice. Like hey, well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to write for us. Oh, I've enjoyed I it. Loved your stories. Cannot wait for you to get these in your hands and get them on your bookshelf. I can't wait either. Yeah, really, really yeah. proud of these and uh, honored to have you. And thanks for your time today. Really well, great. thank you for having me. All right.